<laughs> and so we're going to start off with a story. And so a couple months ago, I was getting into my closet and pulling out my suitcase because I was about to go on a trip. And so I store a lot of my extra clothes and purses and things in my suitcase. That's kind of my extra storage space. And so I was opening up my suitcase um, to repack it so I could leave for my trip. And as I'm pulling things out, I noticed something horrifying. I had never seen this before, but there is this powdery, like speckled stuff, like covering like all of my clothes and purses inside my suitcase. I was like, what is this? What is going on? And so that was my first experience with mildew. And so due to the humidity and kind of lack of poor ventilation and my storage solution, um, yeah, my extra belongings were basically covered with mildew. And so some of the things I was able to wash and repair, and they're totally fine. Um, but unfortunately, there were other pieces, um, like a leather purse that was eaten by the mildew, and it was beyond repair. And so sadly, I had to throw it out. And as I was carrying this out to the dumpster behind our apartment, I was thinking, to myself, you know, this is sad because one, I'll never be able to use this purse again because I have to throw it away. But two, I wasn't using this purse, but I didn't give it away to someone else who could have used it. And because of this poor st storage solution, now it's lost forever and no one will ever get to use this purse that had been perfectly fine. So that was kind of a sad moment a couple months ago. And so I think for me, this story was just a reminder that things um, that support us in our lives, they're all temporary. Everything that we have, um, even you know, our chairs, our stage, our plastic cups that hold the communion wine, like all of these things, like they're all temporary and eventually they're going to fade away. And I don't know if you personally have had an experience with mildew or moths eating your clothes or corrosion or kind of just this decay that happens um, through natural processes. I don't know if you've had an experience with that, but that is just the reality of these temporary things that support um, our human life. And so we're going to dive into our passage today. It's kind of a doozy, so let's go. <laughs> okay, so this is what James says. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look. The wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter or of feasting. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who is not opposing you. So the first thing I thought when I read this passage was, wow, <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, James, I know James isn't one to mince words as we have seen um, throughout our sermon series this summer, but wow, James, James is really going for it here. And so I think as I was reading this passage, okay, this is a very intense passage, but what does this mean for me? Now, in here, in this passage, James is talking about um, field owners who are owning fields and have workers that they're employing in paying wages to mow their fields and gather their crops. And so for me, and probably for many of you here, I don't own any fields. Um, I, don't, 
I don't employ workers to go and harvest my fields. That's not something I can identify with, and I would assume that is the same for most of us here. We are not field owners. And so what does this passage have for us? And what is, first of all, just what is going on in this passage? And so a little bit of kind of historical cultural context. Um, so in this time period, a lot of people were kind of farmers and day laborers. And so in this society, there were some people who were wealthy landowners, and they had all of these fields and all of these crops. And so they would employ um, day laborers to come and mow their fields and gather their crops. And so, again, in the society, for most people, um, they kind of had this, like, daily bread um, economy going on, which means that every day they would go to work. Um, at the end of the day, hopefully, they would get paid for their work, and then they would use that money to go and buy their daily bread um, for themselves and their family. And since they were living very day to day, if you didn't get paid one day, um, that basically means that you and your family weren't going to eat that night. And so getting pay um, every day for your work was really a serious matter um, and a little different for some of us that maybe we have a savings account or we have a little bit of a cushion if we missed a paycheck. Um, for a lot of these people, that wasn't their reality because they were living very day to day. And so they needed their daily wages um, to buy their daily bread. And so basically in this passage, um, James is saying that for these landowners who are either um, like not paying their workers, whether it is through um, greed and not wanting to pay them their daily wages, or whether maybe it's just an unintentional oversight and they forget to pay their workers one day, whether it's intentional, unintentional, whatever is going on in the situation, um, James is basically saying by neglecting to pay, pay your workers like a fair daily wage, um, you are basically contributing to their destruction and to their death, really, as they continue to live um, this life of luxury and of having plenty. While they live a life of plenty, um, their workers are, you know, dying, essentially, um, if they're not being treated fairly. And so... As I was thinking about this passage, I'm still thinking, okay, I understand this context, context, but what does this have to do for me? Like, what does this have to do with us? Again, because we're not field owners, most of us, we're not employing um, laborers to harvest our fields. Um, and so I was thinking, how do I kind of employ people or how am I connected to other people's pay on a daily basis? And so I think now because we live in this very complex, um, very large kind of global economy, we don't necessarily see all the layers um, that happen um, when we spend our money or when we're just going throughout our daily lives. And so what does this mean? I'll give you an example. So let's say this afternoon I want to go out and buy some tacos because I love tacos. A lot of us love tacos. And so let's say I go to the restaurant and I'm going to buy this. And so when I'm eating my taco and I'm spending money at this company to buy my taco, there are a lot of people being employed um, kind of throughout this web. And so at first glance, I see the server who's right in front of me who's taking my order um, and making my food. I know that there are cooks back in the kitchen. There are delivery people. There's a lot of people employed um, just at this company. And so as I'm eating a taco, there, I think I have to think for these people, are they being paid kind of a daily to like live lives of enough um, with what they're being paid? And then if we take it even, let's zoom out, we take it another step back um, past the restaurant, we have to think about, okay, so this restaurant that I am going to. Um, is this restaurant like participating in gentrification? Um, if we zoom out another layer and we think about all the way back to the farmers, um, are the farmers who are growing this food or picking this food, like what is their access um, to having enough to get by? What is their access to healthcare? Um, and even thinking another level, what is going on kind of on a large scale environmentally? And so if I want to have avocado on all of my tacos, because I am a millennial and I 
love avocados, <laughs> obviously. Um, if I'm eating avocados on all of my tacos, is it possible that we are creating such a high demand for avocados um, that we are contributing to environmental degradation long term um, in Mexico or where my avocados are being grown? And is that going to adversely affect um, the farmers there long term? And so I know this, we just went through a lot of levels, and this is obviously a very complicated, um, complex situation that I don't think there are easy answers to. Um, but I wanted to share that example just to show that even though we are not personally like employing people maybe right in front of us, um, we actually are a part of this economy that does basically have all these employees um, working for us in one level, and we all are connected to each other. And I think, too, for us um, living in the U.S. and having just a lot of access um, to wealth and resources, more so than a lot of people in the world, we do play um, a big role and we have a lot of influence um, as we use our dollars throughout the day. And so thinking through that, Okay, so maybe in some ways I am indirectly employing a lot of people. Maybe I do have a lot of access um, to money or to influence. Um, I think it's sometimes it's still hard to have this perspective that, oh, actually, maybe I am quite wealthy. I know we shared um, a couple months ago in an earlier sermon, these are some statistics that if you make, um, as a single income earner in the U.S., if you make more than $27,000 a year, you're actually in the top um, 50% of the workforce in the U.S., and you're in the top 2% of the world. And so for a lot of us, thinking numerically, we actually are like very <laughs> quite wealthy. But I think a lot of times, even though when I read these statistics and I was kind of shocked, I don't feel like I'm wealthy. Sometimes I don't even feel like I have enough because I see people around me who are making more money. Um, I see people on Instagram or in the media that seem like they're able to buy things all the time. A lot of times I don't feel like I'm wealthy, even if statistically I know that I'm doing just fine. And even if personally I know that you know, all of my needs are provided for on a daily basis. And I think because a lot of us tend to live and work in situations where we are around people who are of similar um, like work types or income levels to us, because of that kind of social isolation, um, it can make it hard to realize that even though we may feel like we're not at the top or we may feel just kind of average, um, we're probably actually not. It's just the people we're seeing around us um, have the same amount of us or the people we're seeing in media or seeing celebrities, politicians, these people have maybe much more than us. But that statistically is not normal. That is not the average. And so, again, why does it often feel like I don't have enough? Like, why do I often want more even if I actually do have enough. And so we're going to tell another story. We're going to take it back to Luke 12. And so if you are the reading type, you can turn there. You don't need to. It's fine to just listen. Um, but we're going to be in Luke 12, 13. Just kidding, we're going to start at Luke 12, 16. Okay. <laughs> and so Jesus is talking to a crowd, and he tells them this story. He says, The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have this abundant harvest, but I have no place to store all of these crops. And so then he said, This is what I will do. I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, be merry. And so when I read this passage, the first thing I thought of was basements. <laughs> and so I know in Texas we don't have a lot of basements, but I know not all of you are from Texas. So who here has either had a basement or been in a basement before? Oh, wow, look at the diversity here. Okay, loft. Okay, so, okay, so a lot of you. 
<laughs> and so I am from Ohio, and in Ohio, basically every newish house has a basement. And so if you haven't been in a basement before, essentially a basement is another room the size of an entire floor of your house that you just put stuff in. <laughs> It's just like this like giant storage room the size of half of your house. That's what a basement is. And so <laughs> that's what I thought of when I read this passage. I was like, wow, yeah, I, I've had a basement before. And it's literally just like filled with all of this stuff that we only use like once a year, once every like 15 years ago when we bought it. <laughs> And so I think I could understand the impulse of this man. When he has an exceptionally good harvest or maybe, you know, you're at work, you get a great bonus, you're just like doing like better than normal. And so I think that impulse to think like, wow, like this is awesome. Like I wasn't expecting to get this bonus this year. I wasn't expecting to get um, this pay raise or have such a good harvest. So yeah, you know, I'll just, I'll just, sh you know, put that in my savings account. Yeah, I'll just kind of just chill out now. Maybe I can retire early. Um, maybe I'll just have all this kind of extra cushion so that I can enjoy my life um, and not have to work so hard anymore. And so for me, that was kind of my impulse too. And so what Jesus said next, I was like, whoa. And so this is what Jesus said. So again, the man's saying, I'm just going to build these bigger barns. I'm going to store all my stuff. I'm going to take life easy. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And Jesus says, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich toward God. And so Jesus is essentially saying, like, you think that by storing away all of this extra grain or all of this extra money or extra resources, you think that you're going to be able to know the future. You think you're going to have this security um, and just kind of be able to do like whatever you want to do. But Jesus is saying like, hey, you actually don't know the future. You don't know what's going to happen. Um, and you think that just by providing for yourself and storing up these treasures for yourself, you think you are going to be able to control your future um, and know what's going to happen. But Jesus is saying, like, you don't actually know that. Um, and if we're rich towards things but not rich towards God, um, there's going to be <laughs> there's going to be a disconnect and there's going to be trouble there. And so this actually connects us back to the beginning of our passage in James again. So again, if you want to read in your Bible, you can flip back to James 4.13. Okay, I'll read this part again since it's been a while. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. And so how many of you here have like a Google Calendar, or some sort of planner or calendar you use to, to schedule your life? Wow, not everyone? <laughs> you just remember? How do you remember? <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I have plans. I have things scheduled like far in advance. And so when I read this passage too, I'm like, what is Jesus saying? Is he saying we shouldn't make plans for the future? Is he saying we shouldn't have savings? Like what is going on here? Um, but I think, again, the connection is that Jesus is saying, we can't control our futures. We don't know what is going to happen. And so sometimes in order to create this feeling of security for ourselves, um, we want to control things. Um, and we want to be the ones who are in charge. Um, but Jesus says, you can make plans. Like, you can do these things. But you need to realize that if it is the Lord's will, then it is going to happen. Jesus is saying, you can't just, like, cut me out of, the, out of the equation and think things are just going to go according to your plan. You can't take me out of that equation. And he says to, 
make these plans without um, considering me or considering the fact that you don't actually know the future, without considering the fact that I, you know, God am actually the one in control. That is arrogant boasting. And he says that is actually evil. So that's what he says. <laughs> and so I think thinking back again, we have this group of wealthy people in the church who are storing up all these possessions for themselves. They're making plans. Um, they're just going about their lives, honestly, as myself and a lot of us do, you know, just making plans, saving, kind of like indulging here and there. Um, they're going about their lives. Um, but I think this is where they've gone wrong. So a couple of weeks ago, when Saul was preaching, he gave this illustration um, of the book of Revelation, where it shows Jesus, the lamb, sitting in the throne. And Saul gave this great example of how sometimes we are kind of at war with God, and we're trying to be the ones sitting in the throne. We want to be the ones in the driver's seat and say, Jesus, like, you know, you're awesome. Thank you for saving me from hell, giving me that, you know, to go ticket to heaven. But actually, you can sit here, and I'm going to sit here. You know, I'm going to sit in the driver's seat. I'm going to sit in the throne. But that does not add up. When we put ourselves in the place of God, where we think that we can provide for our own security, that we think we can provide for our own satisfaction, things go awry. Um, and that's where we see this happen. That's where we see this imbalance come from, where we see people storing up more and more and more savings and resources um, because they think they're going to be able to provide for their own security um, because we're not trusting God. We're not trusting God um, to provide for ourselves. Um, that's why we always think we need more. Um, that's why we're never satisfied. And we always have to think, well, if only I buy, you know, I buy this new iPhone or I buy this new dress or I go on this vacation. If only I can get that. Um, if only I can get that promotion, then I'll finally be satisfied. Um, but I think we know that it's never quite enough because we're trying to find our security and our satisfaction um, in our things instead of finding them in God. And again, this is not to say at all that things are bad because they're not. <laughs> they're necessary for life and like they should be used and enjoyed. But again, this imbalance comes um, where we, when we try to find our security and our satisfaction in our things instead of finding it in God. And so what is actually happening is that when we are spiritually insecure, when we're trying to find our security and satisfaction in things instead of in God, our spiritual insecurity is leading to physical insecurity for others. So our spiritual insecurity is leading to physical insecurity um, for others. Um, James said in the previous chapter, in chapter 4, um, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. He says, you do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And so... God is actually deeply concerned that we have enough. He's deeply concerned with that. Um, with our last story with the rich man who tears down his barns to build more, bigger barns to store all his grain, um, right after that story, Jesus actually launches into this long, kind of beautiful sermon um, about the fact that we don't need to worry because he sees us. He sees our needs, our need for shelter, for clothing, um, for food. He sees that, and he knows that we need that. In fact, you know, he created us as physical beings. He lived as a physical being. He knows that we need these things. And so he says, hey, like, I see you. I know you need these things. Like, I want to provide this for you. Um, but again, this imbalance comes when rather than relying on God for our security and our satisfaction, um, we put ourselves in the throne and we rely on our things instead. But the reality is, is that God sees us and God cares for our needs. And so again, I know that most of this sermon, um, James is talking to the wealthy among the church. And I know that 
not all of us fit into that category. For some of us, we're not living lives um, of surplus. We may not even be living lives of enough. We may be living lives more of scarcity, where we are struggling to put food on the table for our kids, where we are wondering where that next rent check is going to come from, where we're not really sure um, if we're going to be able to afford health care when we need it. And I know for some of us, um, that is the case, and we don't have this abundance um, that others might have. And so, again, to that, like, that is something that Jesus is deeply, deeply concerned about and cares about. And that's why he wants to kind of write this. Because when we put Jesus back on the throne and we rely on him for our satisfaction and our security, that is what makes all the other pieces fall into place. That is what allows there to be enough for everyone. Where we don't have... Some people, as James says, who are fattening themselves on the day of feasting, and there are others who are being murdered or who are dying or who are not having enough to get by. Um, seeing Jesus in the throne and allowing him to provide for our security and satisfaction, that is what actually writes these imbalance, imbalances and allows there to be um, enough for everyone. Because um, I think sometimes when we, when we want more, sometimes that's because we're afraid we're insecure, um, we are afraid that we're not going to have enough, you know, and so we want to store up more for ourselves. Um, and Jesus sees that fear, and he sees that anxiety, and Jesus wants to meet us there. When we feel anxiety um, about how we're going to be provided for, Jesus wants to step into that and say, hey, I see you. I don't want you to feel this anxiety. I don't want you to feel this fear, feel like you have to control these things. I want to step in beside you. I want you to know that like, I want to provide for you. I want to give you that peace, that peace so that you can be generous um, with those around you so that you don't have to live this life of fear and anxiety. And then in those moments sometimes where we do, you know, we do have enough, maybe we're not afraid we don't have enough, um, but we we have that greed and we have that desire to always have the next best thing. Um, Jesus wants to step in there too and say, hey, like I see that you're, you're looking for the satisfaction. Like I see you there. And like, hey, like you're not going to find it there. Like you're going to find it in me. And I want to give you that satisfaction. I want to give you that peace. And so even though through our our insecurity or through our greed or desire for self-indulgence, we have, we have really radically messed up the world and created um, a lot of destruction for others around us, especially others who maybe have less access to power and resources than us. Even though we have created kind of this world and like these systems that are not just and are not balanced, Jesus still wants to meet us where we're at and he wants to give us that peace. He wants to give us that security and that satisfaction Again, so we can live lives of peace, um, but also of generosity, that we can share what we have with others, that we can ensure that everyone has access to be able to live lives of enough. That is Jesus' desire for us. And so I think that leaves us with the question that if that's Jesus' desire, that's, you know, that's the gospel, that's the good news, that Jesus wants to kind of write all of this, um, how do we get there? And so I know for, for many people, I think especially in our culture, we like to jump. We like to jump straight to the solutions. And we like efficiency, and we want to just be like, okay, this is the problem. I see it. How can I fix it? Let's go. And the reality is, is that, again, these systems and these problems are extremely complex, and we can't just fix it just like that. Um, but James, thankfully, does actually give us um, a clue of what to do next. How can we get on this path um, to finding our security and satisfaction in God so that, um, yeah, so that we're not contributing to these unjust systems that add to the destruction of others? And I think this is the instruction that James gives us. In fact, in this passage, this is the only like, direct commandment that he is giving to the wealthy within the church. Do you know what it is? It's this. He says, now listen, you rich people, weep and wail. And so, again, when I read this, weep and wail, I have a lot of questions as I'm reading these passages. Um, but I was like, okay, like, 
what, what does that look like? Um, <laughs> I come from a background where we're not super emotional, we don't really show our emotions, we don't really cry in front of each other. And so I think to think of this idea of like weeping and wailing, of lamenting, felt kind of foreign to me. But it's not foreign to the Bible. So for the Israelites, for God's people that are detailed throughout a whole lot of this book, um, lament was actually a common practice um, that as a culture they did. And so whenever there was something not right in society, not right within our own hearts, um, the way that we would respond to that first was by lamenting, was by weeping and wailing and saying like, God, like this isn't right. And like I am going to not just like intellectually, but with my whole person. Like they would actually put on like clothing or put on ashes or things to kind of like physically signify the fact that, you know, things weren't right and like we were grieving over this. And so that idea of like entering in, not just with our intellect, but with our emotions and kind of our full body um, to be able to lament and grieve is actually very biblical, even if it's not something that is familiar to all of us. I remember reading um, in a book about prayer by Richard Foster, where he says that it's oftentimes our tears that connect us like most closely to the heart of God. When we are able to grieve um, with like our spirits, the things that are not right in our own hearts, um, when we are able to grieve over the things that are not right in society, that's actually where our hearts like connect with Jesus and where we give him that space to kind of enter in and transform our hearts so that he can transform our lives and transform our church and society. And so, again, I'm not exactly sure what this looks like for all of us, um, corporately or individually, um, but again, I think reclaiming that idea of lament, of being able to grieve um, for the things that are wrong in society and wrong in our hearts really is an essential um, discipline. I think that at least myself and probably a lot of us um, haven't been practicing. And so what does this look like? Um, I think we could talk as a church or we could talk at our MCGs, like what are ways we could incorporate lament since it is also like a style of worship. Um, how could we incorporate that more into our church? But I think even individually, um, as you are, you know, praying as you are talking to God, as you're examining um, maybe the greed or the fear and the anxiety that exists in your own heart around things like money or material things, when you see that your heart is not in alignment with God, like that is a moment to pause and to grieve. And maybe real physical tears will come, maybe not. <laughs> We're all different, and that's okay. Um, but I think taking that space to grieve and say like, oh wow, God, like, this isn't right, and I want to mourn. I want to mourn over my anxiety, my need for control, over my greed and my selfishness. I want to mourn over that, and I want to mourn over how, like, corporately this has impacted um, those who have less access to resources and power than us. I think it is really important to take um, that space and whatever that looks like for us personally. And so, yeah, I really think that is the application that James is leaving for us. He says, listen and weep and wail. And so all of us have listened this morning um, to this passage, and we've seen how our spiritual insecurity can contribute to physical insecurity for others. And so I think our first response is to take time to mourn and to grieve um, that in our own hearts and in the world. And I know that in that, Jesus will meet us. I know that he has already forgiven us, and he has the power um, to give us that peace so that we don't have to find our security in things. He can give us that satisfaction so that we don't have to look for more and more to satisfy us, even though it won't actually satisfy us. Jesus will meet us um, in our tears, in our mourning, in our grieving. Jesus will meet us there, and that is where the transformation will begin for ourselves and for our church and for our society. And so I'm going to invite the worship team back up and we're going to continue with worship. <laughs> 